have you ever been to Las Vegas? I've never been to Las Vegas. I am shocked. Why? You think I'm a gambler? Like, no, I just feel like, yeah, I feel like Las Vegas is a very you thing. Like, I feel like you would have went to Las Vegas. It's one of those places I think if I went to, I might never come back. I'm, you know what? When you say it like that, I actually would be worried for you. You know, it's like, oh, what happened to Brent? Oh, he's yeah. down, he's down 10 grand at, at <laughs> the craps table at Caesars. Exactly. Yeah, no, now that when you put it like that, actually, it's probably a good thing you've never went. Yeah, it's Vegas and Hollywood, baby. Yeah, I went, I mean, I drove through Las Vegas one time and it was the ugliest city um, that I've ever seen. Really? Yeah, because you're just driving through the desert and then you like make a turn. It's like, oh, look, there's just like a big concrete like shithole in the middle of the desert. Then you drive through it and you just keep going. Okay. That's, that's I did not first, stop. You're the first person I've heard call it ugly. It's ugly. You, it's like driving through fucking Florida. You're just like driving down 75. You're looking at things. And then all of a sudden, everything is a fucking billboard for like some shitty concrete hotel outside, you know, fucking Disney World. And you're like, this whole city is ugly now. Like, ugh. you know, everything's all built up and ugh. not for me. You're not a fan of the uh, legal prostitution out there. They got two. Well, no, that's great. <laughs> yeah. If they, I mean, if they've got legalized sex work, like that's awesome. But um yeah, I'm just, you know, I, I think part of it was when I was driving through there, I had, I was on a road trip by myself. Like I drove to California and back by myself. So I was like high on like, I'm going to go camp in the redwoods. I'm going to go sleep, you know, off sure. the side. Yeah. So I was like high on nature and like just driving through the desert was really cool. And then you, you know, you literally turn a corner. It's like, ugh, like there's Trump tower. Gross. <laughs> it's not great. Go oh my desert. God. Yeah, no. Anyways, you might be wondering why we're talking about Las Vegas. Well, there's a good reason. And it's because we're talking a movie that's kind of just set in that scummy world, right? Well, first, let me say welcome to season two. Oh, my goodness. Welcome to season two. Welcome to Film School Dropouts, a movie podcast in which each season we're going to cover a director's full filmography, as long as it isn't Zack Snyder. My name is James, and I'm here with the son of the man that I murdered, Brent. Dad? No, no, he's dead. I'm your dad now. I'm your father figure now. Well, I need one. Yeah. Well, don't, you and I both, buddy. <laughs> dad, if you're li- listening, I love you. Haven't seen you in years. Um, dad, anyways. if you're listening, I don't love you. I don't know where you are. And oh, I don't gosh. know. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't mean for it to go no. here. I'm sorry. Oh yeah! Welcome Ugh. to season two. We just yeah. finished up uh, season one. We did uh, we did all the films of Christopher Nolan, your yep. boy, my boy. So we've got a little bit of housekeeping to do because um, I came prepared and gave a very concise ranking of my <laughs> Nolan films, and you seemingly were crashing a car when that happened. So, oh, we- do you have your actual like Nolan ranking? I'd love to hear it. Yeah, let's run it down real quick. Okay, just a real quick segment. I'm going to start at the bottom. Work your way up to number one. I I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, well, I don't think this is going to be surprised with how much I badmouthed it. I'm going to just go through it real quick. I got Tenet here at number 11, two and a half, or two and a half stars. Bad. Uh, Number 10, I got Memento, three stars. Okay. Uh, Number nine, I got Insomnia, three and a half stars. Rude. Number eight is a bit of a surprise, but I felt like it belonged here. Inception at three and a half stars. Wow. I'm shocked that you put Inception that low. That's like, okay, interesting. I, you know, that just speaks I, on behalf I, of how much you like his movies. I had to take a hard look at myself in the mirror when I put yeah. it there. <laughs> uh, number seven, we got following four stars. Inception uh, number, is below following. That's correct. I'm fascinated. Uh, uh, number six, we got Batman Begins at four stars. Personally, number enough. five, we got uh, The Dark Knight Rises also with four stars. Okay. Prestige at number four with four and a half stars. Okay interstellar at number three with four and a half stars okay dunkirk that was my first five star movie on the cast that's right and the dark knight with heath ledger's master class at number one okay Uh, there are some shocking things at the lower end your your top like four make a lot of sense to me but like yeah putting the following above inception i was like what okay i was actually um i think going into the season i had uh insomnia uh, not a joke I, it dead went up. I, yeah, I think it was dead last. And it, it, yeah, it I think that's one of my favorites. I think it's like number four for me. So anyways, um, mm-hmm. there you have it. So now we finally got that out in the open. Clean, On concise. to the next one. Uh, yes. So we're starting. I'm very excited. We're talking about Paul Thomas Anderson. This is my favorite director. Um, I don't know if I would say he's my favorite 
director of all time. I will say he is like my favorite like working director uh, who's just, I get very excited about whatever he makes films. Okay, number one on yeah. the current standings. Yeah, I don't know, like I, I, saying like my favorite director of all time, that's kind of, I don't even know if I could put anyone in that spot. It just seems like I have a new one every week. Like, you know, you, it's one of those things, just ask me, ask me tomorrow, I might have a different one, you know? Yeah, you are pretty wishy-washy like that. I am, you know, can't yeah. trust me. <laughs> Um, so before we get into everything, before I, I start vamping about Paul Thomas Anderson and my love for him, why don't we do our little movie segment and talk about something, uh, exciting that we've seen lately. Do you want to, do you want to start it off? Yeah, I, I mean, I can start. Are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mentioned this, it's one of these movies that whenever it's on, I just sit there. I, I you know, it's, it, I don't, I don't like call them guilty pleasures, but for some reason I can't turn these films off. I think the term we should we should do away with the term guilty pleasures because if if it brings you pleasure you shouldn't feel guilty about it right Ooh, okay well, well okay it, in terms of movies I'm not saying cannibals <laughs> or like murderers that's definitely a different thing you should feel guilty about that I'm just saying say, as far as movies go we're about to get a lot more downloads yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, no okay so anyways what's the, what's this movie. Uh, well, I chose this movie because I looked it up and I could not find really anything too noticeable or noteworthy from this director. And this is kind of what I like to use this segment for, for yeah. exciting movies that made me excited that I've watched recently that we might not get a chance to cover on the cast. Right. And uh, so the director's name is James Foley. And this movie actually cleaned up at the Oscars, got a lot of nominations. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross from the 90s. You got to love it. Coffee is for closers, baby. It's an all-time Baldwin performance. Kills it. <laughs> he absolutely kills it. I really like Glenn Gary Gunn Ross. I mean, yeah, I think I've only seen it like once, maybe two times. So I, it's been a really long time. So it's not super cemented in my memory. But yeah, here's I mean, the thing. I, I went for Alec Baldwin. I stayed for Jack Lemon. Yeah, I love me some lemon. I love to squeeze a little lemon on top. I'm not going to lie to you. Feeling a little citrusy. Mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> I love Jack Lemon. Yeah, I mean, what a great fucking pick. Yeah, I think I think uh, you, you and I were talking about James Foley and like that's the name, right? James Foley. Is that what you said? James Foley. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Not not really a director we're ever going to cover, but fuck yeah, Glenn Gary Gunn Ross. Love it. Yeah. The only other movie that I saw um, that I actually liked quite a bit was Fear with Mark Wahlberg and Reese Witherspoon. I, I bought that one, but oh, I don't know if I've ever seen that. I don't yeah, think I've ever seen Fear. Yeah, I count for the time. I, I want to stay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk about Wahlberg. We're going to be talking Wahlberg for sure. <laughs> Not today, but next week. <laughs> Good. I, I wasn't prepared for Wahlberg today. No, no, no. We'll talk Wahlberg next week. How about you? You watch anything? Uh, yeah, um, definitely. I, I was waffling between a couple, but one of them I think we might end up covering one day, so I'm going to skip it. We're going to talk today about a movie that won Best Picture way back in the 40s. Oh, wow. Yep. The movie's called The Best Years of Our Lives. Okay. Yeah, directed by William Wyler. He he did um like Ben Hur and Roman Holiday, but he also did like a like forty other movies that I don't want to ever dive through. So it's like we probably won't ever talk about him on the pod. But I uh yeah I sat down to watch Best Years of Our Lives with a little bit of like hesitation. It's almost three hours long. It's a drama from the forties about like soldiers coming home from war. And I was like, what is this movie going to, it's just going to be like really over the top, like, m like just melodramatic and schmaltzy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Turns out it's like one of the most like empathetic, like deeply felt movies I've ever watched. It was so, it, it follows these three different soldiers who come back from war. And it was so, um, it, it just had so much like love for these characters. And it also wasn't, the kind of American movie you would expect of the time, which is like, look at these brave heroes coming back from war. Don't we love them? Like there was a little bit of like criticism of what was going on. It just, it, it was war, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's right after world war two. Yeah. It's a great movie. Great movie. The best years of our lives. I know it has like a really cheesy title, but fuck man, it, it really rocked. Oh, I, I mean, I, I think, my, I think back in the day, my grandpa might've put it on for me, but you know, I, as a kid, I, yeah, that's, it's, you're not paying attention to that right no i don't think i understand so. I, I think you'd really i think you'd really like it though there's so much good stuff going on in that movie i mean i've definitely heard it enough i'll give it a go the 1940s 1946 I'm, yeah yeah weirdly even though it won best picture and like it's it's like on the afi like top 100 american movies of all time hard movie to find not really hmm. streaming anywhere you have to like hunt down like a physical copy that's out of print but 
Worth you it. Set, you have to set your DVR on Turner Classic Movies. Yeah, exactly. Turn on TCM and just hope it plays someday. <laughs> yeah, for real. Well, um, I mean, that rounds it out. Are we uh, are we ready to to go to go to Las Vegas and lose all of our money? Well, hopefully we can uh, we can win a little bit. Let's break even. Let's break even at least. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, even if I go, I I spend hundred bucks. I look at it as an investment. It's my time. I, I spent it. I had fun. You know. That's you know what that's a good way of looking at it. I have never been to a casino. Oh, yeah, no, not a not a gambling man. Um, you like keep your money. Well, I, my thing is, if I want to, if I'm going to hand my money to a human being, I would like them to give me goods or services in return. Well, this the you know that the service is the joy from playing the game. Mm, no, but what if you lose? Now you just have no money. I mean, yeah, this glass half empty kind of. Yeah, well. That's the kind of energy I bring, I guess. I don't know. Sorry about that. No, um, no, let's talk about Heart 8. Let's talk about it. You know how to count cards? No. You don't know how to count cards, but to stay away from Blackjack. I'd like 150 in dollar tokens. I see the way John worships you and like follows you like you're his captain. John is a very old friend. I haven't told John what I know about Atlantic City. He thinks you don't like him. I don't. So this is your guy's first movie. Yeah, let's actually talk about Paul Thomas Anderson a little bit. Um, I think since this is kind of a smaller movie, like I can use some of this time to just talk about him in general and like why I'm uh, pushing us to do his filmography so early in this podcast. Well, I mean, push is a bit. No, I'm not push. Yeah, I'm not like. I, yeah. I, you can hold my hand. I'm skipping to yeah, watch he, his movies. Right. You know? Yeah, he makes very good movies. He's good at his job. Just like, you know, this is the first I think our, our little format is we're going to go back and forth picking directors. And like my very, my, my top seed number one pick was Paul Thomas Anderson. You can't blame you. Yeah. So I became kind of aware of him, man. I want to say I was like 15 or 16, probably, but yeah, between like the ages of like 14 and 16 was when I saw, uh, there will be blood for the first time. Oh, it was the first movie of his I'd ever seen. Um, and we'll get into that for sure on the, the, on that episode, but yeah, I mean, just, he's one of the first directors, you know, when you're growing up and you hear of directors like, oh, you're, you're five or six years old and you, you kind of have an idea of like who Alfred Hitchcock is or Steven Spielberg, you know, the names. Oh yeah. I mean, Spielberg was the name that, you know, it still is, but yeah. yeah. But I think Paul Thomas Anderson, I think aside from Tim Burton, Paul Thomas Anderson was the first director that like. I had to kind of come across on my own terms um, as opposed to like being shown them and like being told like this is an important director. Like Paul Thomas Anderson was the first director that I was like, I like him. This is like, I've decided <laughs> this is my guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I took a pretty, pretty big shine to him early on. And um, yeah, over the years got caught up on different movies that I hadn't seen. And now I, I just, I pray at the altar of Anderson. That's what I do. I love this guy. He makes movies great. that are um, really hard to pin down. It's going to be harder for us to talk about plots this season because he doesn't have plot heavy movies. They aren't um, about Batman having to fight Bane <laughs> and like save Gotham. <laughs> they're way more abstract and kind of uh, intangible. Uh, they're a lot more about just people talking and really flawed characters uh, doing yeah, really flawed I, things. It's, 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 I feel like it's very character driven. A lot Barry. of us, you know, and that's, but that's fine because if the characters are great and you're getting that dialogue, like, so let's, let's start with this movie. He actually had a pretty decent sized budget for this. Yeah. I mean, compared to Nolan, right. you like, we, you know, we started with Nolan who had a $6,000, you know, pay out of pocket budget, but yeah, Paul Thomas Anderson, this movie comes out of a short that he made called cigarettes and coffee. Um, he got Philip Baker Hall to like do this short film with him. Uh, it was released at Sundance, I believe, and got all this acclaim. So, yeah, he was able to take that and take it to a studio. Um, Reicher Entertainment, I think, was the studio who put this movie out. And like they gave him an actual budget. I think this movie had like a three million million dollar budget. There's some stars attached to it. Like it was a lot different yeah. than following. He, uh, I, I read that he actually wrote this role for philip baker hall yeah which is fascinating because me and and uh, you know where else who else was going to give this guy a lead role (laughs) exactly especially in his first movie yeah like i don't i mean i know philip baker hall from little thing like not too many things but like no i mean he had like um that altman movie 
um, oh man, he played Nixon in an Altman movie, and like he played he I, he named the character Sydney because Phil Baker Hall played a character named Sydney in Midnight Run. He, but he, you know that's a small supporting role. Like sure. you're right. Like who's giving Philip Baker Hall a lead role? <laughs> it's okay. it's pretty great. You know, I I recognized him first from uh, the um, I think the police captain in Rush Hour. Yep. The, yep. the uh, that prank call scene. Yep. When they and he and uh, Chris Tucker is complaining to, oh, that scene's great, and that's they're all great. laughing. <laughs> yeah, like I my uh, my girlfriend's been watching Seinfeld, and I he's in he plays like a librarian in Seinfeld, and I'm like, that's fucking Philip Baker Hall. What is he doing? Like, he's... There's, there's a lot of cameos on there, or yeah, a lot yeah. of guest guest roles in Seinfeld. Well, all those old sitcoms. Sure. But... Yeah, but yeah, uh, this movie stars Philip Baker Hall, John C. Riley, Gwyneth Paltrow, Samuel Jackson, and a little uh, little appearance from Philip Seymour Hoffman. One scene. This movie runs the gamut on people who have like three names for their name. You've got Paul Thomas Anderson, Philip Baker Hall, Philip Seymour Hoffman, John C. Riley, Samuel L. Jackson. Like so many three name people up in this movie. Uh, that means nothing, but I noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> they're uh. That's it. Um, they're artistic folk, you know. Yeah, or people whose names have already been claimed by different SAG actors, so they have to use their middle name because there probably was already a Samuel, a Samuel Jackson in SAG, so that's why he had to put the L in so that he could have his own SAG card. That's kind of why that happens. Is that why? Yeah, I just usually get out there and they're like, you know, I, time to get a stage Philip name. Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, let's talk about Heart Eight. Um, this is your first time seeing Heart Eight. What'd you think, man? It was my very first time seeing Heart Eight. I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, you know, I kind of think of it as it's it's a small package, but it's a yep. pretty package. Okay, yeah. You know, it's there's not. Oh man, I I feel like the dialogue, the most of the movie comes for me. The joy of it came from listening to the characters interact. That's yeah. There's like not much else to get get out of this movie uh, aside from like just really long shots of people talking. Yeah, a lot of dialogue. It is. It is. I, I would say it's on the slower side, yeah. you know. But especially with these directors, like first movies, mm-hmm. you're. I don't think you're necessarily trying to like get that home run right off the bat. You're just trying to get a base hit. You're trying. You know. I don't know about this baseball analogy. Is whether or not it's working. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I felt like play. I felt like he was. He was still getting his like artistic direction where he wanted to do like this was definitely his baby his shots his angles and all that yeah but he wanted to make sure that he didn't like he didn't he didn't uh i'm trying to it wasn't overly ambitious no this one isn't i think magnolia is like the one that's like him like desperately trying to like force his artistic vision like but he goes for it yeah, he does. But I think this movie, I think he's fully formed right out the gate. I think everything that I love about Paul Thomas Anderson and his movies, it's all here. Like every moment of this movie, I was like, oh yeah, this is the best movie ever made. Great. Like this is my favorite movie. Love it. It's got his, it, one of the things that I really love about Anderson that we'll, we'll get into pretty much in every, uh, every episode, he will have characters talking. He'll have a dialogue scene where these two characters are just interacting, like you said, they're just talking. At some point in the scene, you kind of start thinking like, when is this going to end? Like he will just let the dialogue keep going. He will just let the scene play out and play out past what you expect a scene to cut, you know, to, you know, or, you know whatever the next part of the movie is going to be. He'll just let it keep going. And like, this movie's full of scenes like that. And while he's doing that, he's like, if you listen to, the dialogue he's dropping subtle hints about these characters throughout Mm -hmm. so it's like yeah if you're not really paying attention you're just kind of going through the motions you're listening whatever that's fine you know there's not too much happening but if for the you know if you're really listening you can say oh this guy you know he's really trying to earn uh you know john c Riley's character's trust yeah with these little just these little marks yeah like oh hey take the wheel Wow, like that, yeah, you picked up on that one. That's a big one for me. Is him, his, his him giving the wheel, um, or asking oh, why don't you like matches? Try just uh, digging, trying to. It's it's right off the bat these two characters, and you can tell he's trying to build this trust. It's, and, yes, and instantly you're getting these parental vibes, and you wonder why. Like that's yeah. one of the great things about this movie is you're like, he, like it's kind of like Nolan. He's withholding some of these pieces. The, yeah, I think the, the difference with, I mean, the what? major difference is like, 
with Nolan, it's all plot. It's all like, you know, what's wh what's this going to end up being? Whereas with Paul Thomas Anderson, it's like completely interior. Like you, you the the it's plot doesn't ever kick in. Depth. This movie. It's all it is, right? Yeah. So let's talk about the plot of well, quote unquote plot of this movie. We can walk through kind of all the scenes of this movie and uh, just kind of chew on whatever we want to chew on. Um, so the movie opens up with John C. Riley sitting outside of a diner in Philip Baker Hall, just walking up to him saying, hey, what do you think? Well, you know what? Before we even get into that, what do you think of um, John C. Riley? What's 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 your John C. Riley take? Yeah, let's cover all these actors, right, real quick. So John C. Riley, I've always kind of like, I didn't like him at first. And then no. when he did what, his comedy um, What is that terms, based on? What, what, what did you not like him in? Chicago. Oh, his Oscar, his Oscar nomination. Yeah, I didn't like him in Chicago. Okay, I actually didn't like that movie, so it kind of took down Richard Gere for me. Chicago's yeah. fine, yeah. Yeah, it's just, I thought that was like crazy overhyped for the time, and I just, I, I, I grew like, a, I don't know, I grew kind of like a little, not hatred, but I just didn't like it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that kind of put a, but then he, he won me back over with all his um, Will Ferrell comedic stuff, like Talladega Nights, I loved he's, it. Weirdly, um, he's like a weird perfect pairing for will ferrell yeah oh it's so great uh They're step great brothers together. was great um Love step brothers. so yeah he won me back over um with the comedic stuff and i've okay. slowly been kind of i saw one with him in um i think it's jonah hill where jonah hill's like um john c riley is like the stepdad and he's trying to be nice oh wait oh i'm thinking of um uh, take it all back we need to talk about kevin oh my god we need to talk about kevin yeah We'll talk about Kevin someday. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say, say that, yeah, that was, I, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, he's great. He's but. so good. Yeah, he's incredibly, it, it's weird because I think most people would recognize him from the Feral movies as like a goofy comedic guy, which like makes a lot of sense. Look at him. Like he has clown hair and like a weird caveman face. You know, it's, it's a weird looking dude. But when you dive in and you find him in all these dramatic, like really dramatic roles, like dude kills it there. Yeah, I mean. I thought he was great here. That's for sure. I love him in this movie. One of the things that he's like uh, Anderson uses him very well. Cause he's in like the first three um, PTA movies. One of the things that's so that Anderson uses very well about him is his weird, like man child persona. Like he has this, like he's a really tall guy. He's kind of intimidating because of how like strange he looks, but his voice is so soft and he has this sort of like blubbery idiot sort of, yeah, you know, I know, I know exactly what you're talking you about. Do, yeah, he I mean, actually plays it up in the well. They, it goes, it's perfect for this character. Oh yeah, because yeah. this character is kind of um, and he doesn't have he, you know, he doesn't have a guiding figure in his life, and he, right. he is he doesn't seem very intelligent. No, he's a little aloof. Yeah, he's yeah, kind of a goofball, and like, well, not even a goofball. He's just kind of adult, unsophisticated. Yeah. You know, is where you got on the other hand, you got this this calm, Sydney. cool, collected Sydney just. This guy, every scene he's in, you just kind of oh, get the the sense that he's in control, you know? And he does not ever let his emotions, like, sneak up on him, ever. He oh, is it's... always in control. He's always got a suit. Like, he's, he's, a, he's a very prim and proper guy. So, anyways, the movie starts with Philip Baker Hall meeting up with John C. Riley, and he seemingly just picks him randomly and is like, I'm going to help you out. He offers him coffee and cigarettes, and they start talking. If I were to give you $50, what would you do with it? I'd eat. How long can you eat? How long can you live on $50? I don't know. I would bet not very long. You would bet? I'll tell you what. You come with me back to Vegas, I'll loan you $50, I'll show you what you did wrong. Why? What, what, look, what are you, man? You, you, think, you think you're St. Francis or something? Uh, no, I don't think I'm St. Francis. And again, this is just a really long scene of two people talking about nothing, really. You know, it's Phil Baker Hall asking him about what kind of money he's lost in Las Vegas, and then they... You, you you start to get the sense that for whatever reason, Philip Baker Hall wants to help this guy, and John C. Riley is on the defensive, like, 100%. And in, in this scene, you find out that, uh, you know, the main reason was he went to Vegas to try to pay for his mom's funeral. 
Yes. I like this part because right at the end of this little diner like conversation, mm-hmm. the the music shifts into like this kind of like right before the title music. It's like this little upbeat yeah. Yeah, little yeah, thing yeah. going on. It's really cool. I like that. Oh, I got a I got a quick question before we get too further. Is this a Christmas movie? Is it? There's two Christmas songs in it. Does it take place around Christmas? I, don't I even... think this is a freaking Christmas music movie. <laughs> I really do. I, I think uh... it's I think it's Christmas in Vegas. That's why you don't see any of the weather. But there's Christmas music playing on in the background, and even when the credits roll, there's a Christmas song. I didn't pick up on that at all. This That's is a Christmas movie. Hard Eight, one of the classic Christmas movies. <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> Unbelievable! Yeah, I mean, watching Ad- a Addison Christmas Pantheon. movie. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this whole scene plays out and you're you're really wondering why Philip Baker Hall is choosing to, like, help this guy. You have no there's no backstory in this movie at all. The you movie just starts a like guy, he just walks up to him and helps him. Yeah. Just a random guy that. Right. You don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you don't know whether to trust Sydney or not. You know, you're just kind of like the guy seems in control, but maybe he's too in control. What's going on here? And uh he ends up convincing John C. Riley to come with him to Las Vegas. And he's like, I'm going to help you like win some money. I can't give you $6,000 to bury your mother, but I can help, you know, I can point you in the right direction on how to, how to run the casinos and stuff. So then they're in the really car. cool scene. Well, we'll, we'll the, the oh, con, yeah, that they run. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the con. They're yeah. in the car. And like, I think this is maybe my only complaint for the whole movie is PTA puts in like two really funny fucking edits in this scene of them driving to Vegas. And then the rest of the movie, there's practically no humor at all. I think Paul Thomas Anderson movies are fucking hysterical. I think most of them have like crazy, like hilarious humor. That's not joke based. It's all like, it's all based on like timing characters and like weird edits. But the first one you get is as soon as they start driving, John C. Riley's in the back seat and Philip Baker Hall's in the front. And he's like, clearly just doesn't trust him. And he wants to sit in the back seat because he doesn't trust this guy. And they're talking a little bit. And then John C. Riley goes, uh, can you stop the car? And then it immediately jump cuts to him in the front seat of them driving. Because he's like, all right, I, I trust you enough. I thought that was great. And then the scene of him talking about the matches exploding in his pocket. So why don't you use these matches? It's just a rule with me, okay? I don't use matches. Why not? I had a really bad experience once, and I promised I'd never use them again. Tell me. You know those big monster books of matches, like those big daddy ones with like 40 matches in them? Yeah. I had one of those in my pocket once, and they just lit on fire, just exploded. Oh, uh, matches just went off? Yeah, it's like, it has something to do with friction, I guess. Spontaneous <laughs> friction. I mean, they just went off. I mean, I'm standing there in line for a movie, and all of a sudden, just bam! Whoa! Whoa! Like that, you know? It scared the shit out of me. I had a third degree burn on my leg. It was this close to my dick. And that was a that was a brand new pair of jeans too, you know. Well, yeah, that that was. I mean, uh, that at that part, I actually laughed out loud. I was cracking up. Like <laughs> he does a little jump cut where he's yeah, telling exactly, the story starts... about why he's afraid of matches. Yeah, because you're like, why the fuck won't he take matches? Because he lets that <laughs> linger for a second. You're like, what the fuck? And then finally, he tells the story about how a box of matches like spontaneously erupted in his pocket. And, and what's it was so be, funny. It'd be but, one thing for him just to talk about it, but Paul Thomas Anderson you cut. gives us the scene. Yeah, you actually like, cut him standing in line at the movies in his pocket <laughs> erupts in flames. There are so many things about this that I find so funny. Like, the edit itself to actually cutting to the actual scene is hysterical. The fact that he like freaks out and then really quickly pats it out and like it's not a big deal. Like the flame wasn't that big. It like spontaneously pops up. He pats it out. It's done. Not a big deal at all. But that has scarred him so much that he refuses to ever use matches again. And then the fact that like the first thing he says when he's talking about is it it almost burned my dick off. Like he is so on guard for his masculinity the whole movie and it's like that's his one concern is it was that close to his dick he, like, he tried to uh sue the match company right? yeah, like, <laughs> it's so it's like that's such a fucking funny joke that he's I, there's so many weird jokes in that that little that little jump cut i loved it so much but then again you don't really get any humor for the rest of the movie really yeah that's about it yeah the movie kind of goes on and like the tone just sort of gets more and more like not like dark but like it just sort of gets more like serious yeah is that the way to put it i don't know yeah I, no i mean even keel no it's just i don't know until it just levels off i guess sure but and yeah, but then the right other... at the right at the end you get that little spike 
of oh, uh man. yeah yeah but um yeah i think the only other funny scene is with phil seymour hoffman which we'll definitely get to so he gets him to the casino and he he shows him this really cool like scam that he can run where he's just cycling the casino's own money on top of itself till he has enough credit to get a room for free right i, I do that trick all the time i was gonna say you ever pulled that off at greek town or anything like that yeah with my player's card allegedly anyone listening this is alleged he didn't actually do it just so you don't get sued or anything right well i i think i think this movie might have put the light shine maybe shined the light and they might have tightened up procedures after, after yeah 96. i mean i was reading um i was reading ebert's review of this movie he gave it like three and a half out of four stars really liked loved it. it yeah but i was reading his review and one of the lines was he's, he said uh i really like when movies show me how to do something like this movie does which is great i love the idea of ebert being like hmm I wonder if I could pull that off. <laughs> you know, just learning a little scam from a movie. Love that scene. It's so oh, yeah. It's really I think exciting. that's my my favorite uh, my favorite scene of the whole movie. Honestly, really? Yeah, I don't know. I've only seen it not only now, so. not only does it you know it shows the cool technique and all that, but it's a nut just right on top of what we just saw. It's another layer of just him guiding him, yeah, and like teaching him when he literally was sitting on the side of the building with no, a couple of dollars with no yeah exactly that night he finishes with like in his grand. room yeah, yeah he's got his own room pay-per-view and it was you know they, they do a little time time hop so yeah i wanted to talk about that cuz but right before the time hop you know it, john c riley's in his room he's good he's taken care of got money he's on he's headed on the right track Right as Philip Baker Hall's character is going to leave, you know, you get this like kind of like childlike wonder, like, "Hey, you going to you going to gamble some more?" He's like, "Can I come?" Uh, it's like, just if, if that's what you want to do. Like, he, I, I love Philip Baker Hall's. Just like he's going to take care of this kid. He's going to be nice to him. He's not going to like. It, it's great. Um, but I do love the jump cut here because you get no backstory for either of them. You don't get any backstory for John or Sydney. Then you spend a night with them of him like learning how to gamble from Sydney and you don't really get why any of this is happening. You don't know why Sydney's helping him. You don't know. You, I guess you can understand John because he just wants money and like, he's got someone to help him. But like the whole thing is about Sydney. Right. And you're like, okay, what is, Yo, what's what's going, going on? Here? He... And then instead of like explaining that or diving into that at all, two years later, we just cut two years. So it's like, instead of, I think that's so force, smart. Instead of force feeding us backstory for this character, it's like, Oh no, we're watching the bat. We're, we're watching the little bit of interaction kind of like we're seeing the backstory and now we're getting the real thing. And then later on we get, we get a little, little, uh, well, the very end, right. You get yeah. like a little bit of a re reveal, but like, I don't know the decision to do a two year j time jump. It almost, it almost is like subversive in the way that like you're, wondering what's going on with these characters, who they are, where they come from. And instead of learning anymore, you end up learning less because a whole two years goes by. You don't get any of that information either. You don't get to know the two years of John and Sydney hanging out together. You don't no. know what their relationship is. You like the scene that you jump to two years later, you essentially have the exact same relationship. You're just kind of starting to pick up on where they are just from behavioral things. You don't get any actual like, you know there's no fucking flash forward flashback time you know ex explaining what's going on with them no pretty much the only thing you get is just like what you saw earlier but just the bond is a little more cemented you know yeah yeah i mean it's clear that john is sort of following i mean even gwyneth paltrow says it like he follows you around like a puppy dog like he's so like idolizes you well so this is where you meet gwyneth paltrow's character She's... Yeah, I think pretty much right in this first scene, you meet Gwyneth Paltrow and Samuel Jackson's character. So let's yeah. talk about Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay, so how do you feel about her? I mean, it's hard to like her now. Really? Just well, yeah, she's doing the whole goop thing with, I don't, like, the, she's just she's just a it. weird. Yeah, no, she sells like Jupiter cum or whatever, and you're supposed to rub it in your hair, and it makes you psychic or what? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, she's just kind of gone off the deep end a little bit, and also I don't think she's really particularly interested in acting. So when she does show up in movies now, it's kind of like, yeah, she's fine, I guess. But I mean, right around this time, I thought she was great. Like, I really like her in all these movies. In this, I mean, she does Shakespeare in Love in this time, Talented Mr. Ripley. Like, she's kind of good all the way up until I want to say Iron Man. I think Iron Man is like the last time that I think that she's like engaged and like fun. Hey, let's tone down the MCU hate. No, no, know. I think she's good in Iron Man. I love Iron Man. I think Iron Man's good. I didn't say anything negative about Iron Man. <laughs> I, th I think she's always had uh, 
I thought she's always had chops. Like I've I've seen her great. Yeah, it's not you know. I think I think she, like currently she's more often good than she's not. You know, it's it's not like a rarity that I you know oh wow she was amazing here. That's you know that that's different. I think she's more she's always good in my mind. Yeah, I just don't think she does it anymore. I don't like when was the last time she was good in a movie? Probably Iron Man, right? I mean, I can't. I'm like looking through her IMDb right now, and it's just a lot of. Eh, she was in Contagion. That was she was good in Contagion, but she gets killed yeah, pretty she quickly in that movie. Strong twelve minutes. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, there's one where I think it's Anthony Hopkins is her Al- her father with Alzheimer's, and like I mean, she has to finish his notes. Uh, no, I'm trying to. You talk about the father that just came out. No, no, no. I mean, we don't have to get caught up on right, Paltrow, right. But like, yeah, yeah. I just, um, I think right around this time she's great, and then you know, a couple of years later she does the Royal Tenenbaums, which is very important to adolescent James that she plays Margot Tenenbaum. And then um, we've also got Samuel Jackson showing up in this scene. He's kind of scary in this. He is. He's coming off of um, Pulp Fiction, so he's kind of a, he's probably the biggest star in the movie at this time. Or period. I mean, like, even if you yeah, even now, like, he's still the biggest. I mean, he star. kills it. Okay, I, I feel like in this. I movie? feel like yeah. I feel like he's always good, he, but he rule. Yeah, he's great. Even when Samuel Jackson's lazy, it's like, well, it's still Samuel Jackson. I still like him. In this movie, he was kind of flirting between this line of like friend and like I, and it just yeah. it kept me off guard. And I thought he did a great job. So I guess to establish these four characters, you've got Philip Baker Hall, who is like this kind of old-timey classic gambler guy who has like a mysterious past that you don't really learn about you got john c Riley, who is his protege and he just admires him so much you've got samuel jackson who is like kind of the evil version of sydney he's also kind of a hot shot in las vegas but he's a lot more flashy and like you know he's always picking up women and cussing and like so you know. john he's apparently works security for the hotel he works security for some hotel i don't know okay. if it's that hotel because I think that's the scene where he's like, what, do you work in the parking lot? And he's like, no, motherfucker, I work in the hotel. Sydney's so, I really like Sydney, but he is so, like, like passive aggressive and, like, so condescending to Samuel Jackson in this movie. Well, I mean, he, from that opening scene, he didn't appreciate the foul language coming from his table. I mean, hey, that's I get it. That's cool. I get and then it, too. Gwyneth Paltrow plays a waitress who also does, like, sex work um i guess on the side yeah yeah at first you don't know at first you you uh you know she it looks like she has like a little crush on john yeah john c Riley's character and then sydney uh kind of i don't know does he does he follow her and sees what she's doing he sees her coming out of a room and it's just kind of implied that they both know what just happened like he he knows that she just I like, kind of got the vibe like he was that was just another like once he got the like the smell that she was kind of interested in his quote unquote son or John yeah. that she, he kind of did his due diligence and wanted to make sure and just another way he was looking out for him didn't want that's to get a good hurt. that's a good read I didn't I didn't get that read but like yeah like he he kind of sees that she's interested in John and maybe the two of them have been flirting and he's like all right well if that's the case then I'm going to take care of her and put her in a better position so that the person that i'm taking care of can be happy with her is that what you're getting at absolutely yeah it's i think just, that makes I, a lot of sense and, and again like none of that is explained that you just picked that up through behavioral stuff because it was the way he was so protective in every single facet of john john c Riley's, um uh, mm. you know character's life it's just like that would only make sense and so the very next thing he does like you said he takes care of gwyneth paltrow's character takes her back to his room his and john yeah. c Riley's room gets you know puts her to bed makes sure she's good what happens the next morning well i mean that night she's like do you want to fuck me well, that, like, oh, yeah I got, I got that as a note that's you know sydney's character is so much in control she mm-hmm. it, like it's just an assumption that you know he's gonna he deserves to get like right. you know right he's like the man but yeah i mean of course yeah, he's, he's like, like no that's not what i'm here for yeah exactly but yeah the next morning go ahead who are you gonna say well just he come you know he's comes to the room and he hears lo and behold john c Riley. and now i kind of i kind of took this as a little bit of a setup because even though before the night ends he's like oh um you know you'll be gone or He's, he he kind of makes it clear that they won't their paths won't intersect. Yeah. But then 
they do and they right. meet like they're in the room the next morning yeah just ch chatting it up yeah I, I, th that's actually the other really funny joke I, like i watch all my movies with subtitles just because like i don't know i just do but you might not have heard it if you didn't but there's that scene right before he goes into their room and you can hear john c Riley telling her the story about the matches again <laughs> it's really fucking funny I, I, I didn't hear that that's actually yeah, he's, hilarious he's walking up to the door and you could just hear like muffled voices he's like hey, and they just erupted in my pocket <laughs> like oh he's my just in gosh. the middle of telling her the story makes you wonder how he's many just, times he's, he's told just, that story like, he's so scarred from those matches <laughs> it's so that's good. great it makes you uh, want to go back and watch that little snippet yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah so i mean you get the setup now that like john c Riley and clementine are maybe like they're starting to hit it off you know, it's kind of all that's really going on, right? Well, and then you get uh, Sydney saying, hey, take her out. Take her out shopping. Take her mm -hmm. to get some new clothes. Take her, show her, have her, tr basically treat her to a good day. Take her mm -hmm. out because he wants them to hit it off. It's just, yep. he's trying his hardest. You still don't know why Sydney cares so much he, about this. No, guy. he's just trying to create this. He's trying to create a great life. Yep. Like I, I need my, I need to get a Sydney in my life, you know. Just <laughs> well, I don't know if that's what you want, <laughs> but oh, <laughs> you know what? Honestly, I, no, I'm okay with it. I Once think I'd take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd let a Sydney come into my life. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I'm not no, losing no. nothing. No, no, I will. I would be, but <laughs> anyway. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, the price would be too much for me to pay, but maybe not for you. So I guess the next big kind of the bit, next big scene is, and, and the really the only set piece in this whole movie is the hostage, the hostage room, right? Yeah, I mean, so after, you know, he's like, go out, have a day, whatever. Looks like everything's going to plan, nice and calm and collected. Sydney gets a call in like the middle of the night. Yep. And John's like freaking out. Yep. So Sydney goes to this hotel where John is and he's talking to John through the door. And John's like, you got a problem with that? He, he's panicking on the other side of this door. And Sydney, just cool, just cool as a fucking cucumber. Like, let me in, John. You know, like, so he lets and him then in the room. One of the coolest shots okay love it Let's love it. this part it's like this prolonged shot where you just it's the the camera's just framed on both of their faces oh where you can see that philip baker you Hall don't know what's in this room yeah you know good. that you know that john c Riley's character was freaking out over something you don't yep. know what it is yet yeah he lets it linger for a while before you a, actually get to see a what's long going on. time and then excruciatingly yeah. long i'm like a really oh, long time God. and then he he draws it out even longer than you think because you get this really long scene of the two of them and you can see John C. Riley looks kind of embarrassed while Philip Baker Hall is looking inside this room. You can't see what's going on. And then finally, Philip Baker Hall says, who is this man? And you still don't get to see like, what man? You're like, what man? What man? Show me the man. What, what's going on? You know, he, he draws it out, man. As a viewer, you know, you're sitting there forced to only imagine the worst. Right. And then he's like, who's this man? What man? You know, what man? Yeah. Like, oh, God. you don't know what to think. I think so, he says, like, is he alive next? Yeah. He's, yeah. Is he, is he dead? He said, no, he's just knocked out. Before you even see him. Yep. It's like, oh, God. Yeah, he really so he's that lingers. messed up to where you don't know if he's alive or dead. You know? It's, yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, you get to see, like, there's a lot of blood on that pillow. Like, and then you know, in that same you know when he finally does cut and you see it you yeah you see it all blood but then you see gwyneth paltrow commentine sitting on the ground kind of like oh god like what did, what happened with her she's yeah she's like huddled up on the ground like shaken shaken yeah so the whole scene is like what happened yeah you gotta slowly learn what happened and i i love this scene because like none of the characters come out and say exactly what happened like you're kind of in Philip Baker Hall's shoes where you're like, okay, I need you guys to fucking calm down and explain to me, the audience, what happened because I'm stressed. And Philip Baker Hall just keeps it pretty cool the whole scene. And he's like, just tell me what happened, you know? Well, I want to also give this movie crazy props because, okay. you know, we, we, we've already talked plenty about how great the dialogue is, but I want to yeah. talk about how real the dialogue is. Yeah. You know, they, this is, this is, I think it's so important for like, if I'm watching a movie and I hear two characters, I'm like, there's no way like that's not how real people talk yeah here this it's is how fair. real people i mean talk. i think that's just kind of how all of his movies are like you you're just kind of like because in like it's one of his mo's for sure yeah i mean he's just fucking great at writing movies um but yeah the whole scene is that clementine had slept with this this john and he didn't pay her so she she called her boyfriend or, or no wait her husband because we just we learn in this scene that they're married because philip baker yeah. Hall starts screaming at clementine and calling her stupid and john c Riley's like that's my wife 
and you just like says, face palm instantly face palm big face palm but i just love john c Riley's boyish demeanor because like he says that's my wife and it sounds like a 14 year old like play acting yeah 100 you know, like, it's like 14 year old i need to protect my new girlfriend yeah exactly like, <laughs> yeah um it's great but yeah you learn that they're married and that she slept with this guy and he didn't pay her so she called john c Riley. he showed up and knocked him out and now they're they, they're keeping him hostage they've called his wife and have, have told her like we're keeping your husband hostage so much happens in the scene and phil baker hall pretty much keeps it cool he, he explodes a couple times in this scene but like i think he does it in a way to try to keep everyone else cool like it seems like very intentional the way he's yelling yeah, I mean, you can. T- I mean, his frustration is building along with the viewers because yes. he's trying to get these details out, and you're like, "Gosh, I need to," you know, "I, yeah. I we need these details too," and he, yeah. like to the point where you don't want to see, you know, you just got used to, you just met all these characters, and now you're like, "Oh God, like, did they call the cops?" And he's like, "Did you call the cops?" And oh, you called the wife. Well, she called the cops. And what did you say to the? Yeah, what? It, yeah, I, I, uh, I love. Uh, Philip Baker Hall's like extremely commanding line delivery when he's just like, "Give me the fucking gun, John," and, and John just like hands him the gun, like, "Yeah, okay, here you go, Dad." Like he's he's so in charge of this whole scene, man. It's great. You kind of learn that maybe Jimmy showed up at one point, like he called Jimmy, and that's where he got the gun from. So you know that Jimmy also knows about this whole interaction. This is the big climax of the movie, really. And you already, yeah, I mean, you already had suspicions about Samuel Jackson, Jimmy's character also. Because yeah, he seemed kind of scummy. I the, the weird thing about Jimmy is he seems scummy, but he doesn't seem any scummier than, like, any other character in the movie. He just seems more, like, flashy. I don't, I don't, like, I'm never, like, worried about Jimmy. Yeah, well, I mean... No, are you are you you, you like kind of? He's, he scared me in this movie. I mean, yeah, you Samuel Jackson. I, he's pretty scary. Like, I don't know. I, just, I don't know when it happens. When's the scene with Philip Seymour Hoffman? Is it before this or after this? Oh, um, I can't remember. It is a crazy scene that I want to get into. I think it's after he already sent him. So the the culmination of this scene, he ends up getting them to just leave. You know, just send him out of town. Just get him out. Go to Niagara go, Falls, John. Yeah. But I've been there before. <laughs> I don't care, John. Pick a, I love that a, he's being picky about it. It's so funny. <laughs> Pick a honeymoon spot and yeah. go. Yep. You know, who you just get out of town, lay low in case this wife calls the cops and you got to, uh, because at one point they threatened to as a, uh, a death he's, threat. He's kidnapping. Yeah. He's taking a hostage. Like, but, like yeah, that was, a, threat, that, that right. was a big one that triggered my mind because well, they said like they were going to, is like crazy, right? Like that's a terrible offense. I don't know. I, uh, but, yeah, I mean they're in trouble. If this if this gets out, they are in trouble. Big time. So he just gets them on the road, gets them out of town. Things are starting to cool back down. Um, and I think this is when you get to have your one glorious scene with with C- Philip Seymour Hoffman. I'm not allowed to cigarette, old timer. What are you gonna do? Two thousand dollar heart eight. Two thousand dollar heart eight's a bet. Oh, man, you play that game, don't you? Oh, shit. (laughs) You're big time. You are big time. (laughs) Oh, hard eight. Oh, okay, here we go. All right, here we go. All right. This is for you, big time. All right, I'm not even looking. Here we go. Hey, six. Hard six. Hard six? That's a hard six, old timer. That's not bad for me. That's not bad for me, is it, sister? It is Sister Sledge. <laughs> there we go. It's me and you. You know what I'm saying? For fucking hundred. Party! Hundred. Me and you, big time. Me and you. You can buy yourself another suit with this roll. Forty-four. Fucking forty-four, big time. Two thousand. Two thousand hundred. Hundred. Two thousand. Two thousand hundred. Hundred. Two thousand. 44! The scene is crazy. It has nothing to do with the movie at all. It has nothing to do with anything that's going on in the movie. It is a long scene of Philip Baker Hall going to a craps table, and he's confronted with Philip Seymour Hoffman, who is like... It comes out of nowhere. It comes out of nowhere. It's such a good scene. It has nothing to do with anything, which is probably what? most of Philip, uh, most of Paul Thomas Anderson's scenes that I love are like scenes that just have nothing it's, to do with anything. Like it just cuts to... 
a craps table and he's, yeah. he's standing there and you got loud long, long hair he's got like a mullet long. yeah like chirping he looks, he looks like so trashy just think, chirping away at the table just well what's great about this scene is philip baker hall like you, you hear a story about him betting like two thousand dollars on a hard eight earlier in the movie and this is kind of like an echo of that so you get to see him go up and he bets two thousand dollars that philip uh seymour hoffman is gonna like roll the hard eight and like baker hall in control not showing anything philip seymour hoffman he is like the yin to his yang he is like trashy he's yelling he's cussing he's like all right big time all right he, it's, he's he's the complete but they're working together like if, if one of them if he hits big on the hard eight they both are gonna mm-hmm. hit and of course he doesn't he just he, he's so it. fired up by this badass sydney that yeah. he's like you know what? i'm putting 100 on it too this yeah, guy's exactly. firing up firing me up just with his yep. persona like yeah it's uh, just like this aura. weird clash between like these two yeah i don't even know how to explain it it's a bizarre scene i love I it i cannot speak highly enough about philip seymour hoffman's acting here we're gonna be he doing that a lot just, this season. I, oh my I, god, it, he is so free. I'm, t- you know, it, this will be the first time he's saying it on the podcast, but it is. He was a generational talent. He, there's no one else like him on the planet. Like oh. we will never get an actor like him ever again. And we're going to be talking about him a lot. He's in most of his movies. I mean, I've always thought he was amazing. This he's is uh, this favorites. is a, just a random one-off scene yep. from a movie that I probably wouldn't have watched, and. It blew me away. You know, I said earlier that I like that prolonged shot. I like, and that was that was amazing. But yeah. I think this is the best scene. This and is probably the best. Like, this is the scene that I always think about when I think of this movie, which is weird because it doesn't have anything to do with the movie. That's how great this acting is. <laughs> yep. His face, he, the, the his the faces that are going the the roller coaster emotion. Philip Seymour Hoffman is going through at this table, yep. like I also bouncing think, off looks back off Sydney's character, just yep. like seeing what's but going on. I also on. think that like Sydney's like the, Philip Baker Hall is incredible in this scene too, because he's sort of like the way that I read this scene is like, he's confronting himself in this scene. He's confronting like what he represents. And he has like this kind of self-loathing, like contempt look on his face, like the whole scene where he's betting money on Philip Seymour Hoffman. And then he just walks away from it, like, calm as a cucumber. Like, he's like, I need to fucking, I'm disgusted with myself that I did this. And, like, just walks away from it. It's such a bizarre, I don't know. I guess, yeah, one of the other things that we could talk about, like, now up front in, you know, episode one of the season. We're going to be talking about three of my favorite actors of all time, like, several times. Because you're going to get a, a lot of Philip Seymour Hoffman performances. Uh, two incredible Daniel Day-Lewis performances. And then a couple of awesome Joaquin Phoenix performances this whole fucking series. He's just like an incredible actor's director. I mean, those those definitely are three as far as like talent goes. Yeah, those are like, those, yeah. those three are right at the top for all some Oscars. of the best I've ever seen. So yeah. So anyways, I'm just excited. excited. I'm excited. And I, I personally think Daniel Day Lewis is the greatest of all time. Like absolutely like it's a boring take to be like i think daniel J. lewis is the greatest actor of all time but like hey, um, sorry <laughs> it's just look like, at him <laughs> they just put out a movie of his and it's like oh yeah well there it is <laughs> the, the oh proof. so that's what acting is supposed to be exactly like. <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah i'm very excited to talk about it. but yeah i mean that scene i think we've gone on enough about it but like what a scene what a crazy scene to put in this movie and to just nail like i want to go watch it that's how it's good such a good scene yeah and after this like john and clementine leave town and jimmy uh approaches sydney and this is when you get like the big reveal this is the big like this is the big like blow up scene of the whole movie right right yeah so jimmy reveals he knows what happened in Atlantic City and you're like oh wait what happened in Atlantic City because like the whole movie you get nothing there's no information you're like ooh, 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 we're gonna learn something that happened in Atlantic City fucking feed that into my veins right now please yeah you finally hear that line you're like oh boy here it goes you don't yeah, have to wait long bad. to find no. out no it's a short movie anyways but yeah like once he once he sets that in motion it all kind of like comes tumbling out and like it's sort of like a race to the finish once this this line is uttered yeah he says it and and sydney kind of laughs it off like get out of here you stupid gets out of the car you know goes to leave and that's when uh samuel jackson jimmy's character ramps it up takes his gun breaks the window he's yeah this is this is when i was like oh yeah this is when i was like oh my god do whatever he says like i'm terrified right now yeah samuel jackson's so good in this movie it's he really is yeah like people are missing like 
This is a movie that made less than a million dollars when it came out. No one really knows about it. You know, it's a debut film. People are missing out. At, at the very least, there's like three, in, there's four incredible performances in this movie. There's five yeah. incredible performances. Like, when Paltrow got roles in this movie, she's so I good. just, I, this is what I'm going to be, I'm going to be trying to pay attention towards for this season, Paul Thomas Anderson season. Mm -hmm. I want to know if his movies, his scripts, you know, the way he shoots enhances an actor's performance. Does he make actors better than what they are? Oh. Or does he just brings out, does he, he brings the cream to this crop, you know, brings the cream to the surface. He brings out their best stuff. Like I will, we can definitely track that as the season goes along. But like the thing that I love about Paul Thomas Anderson is he will take an actor and he will use them in a way that no one has ever used them before. He, he'll, he'll just absolutely like look at an actor and be like, no one's ever done this with you, Adam Sandler. And he'll just get that punch drunk love performance. Like that's what he does. Um, but we'll definitely, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about how crazy the performances that he gets out of actors are. So yeah, Jimmy tells Jimmy tells him like, yo, I know that you killed John's father. So then like the second you ding, hear ding, that, ding, ding, ding. this exact, the second you hear that, the whole movie is solved. Like he killed John's father. He feels so guilty about it. So he went and found John and now he's like making up for it. And he will be doing that for the rest of his life. And that's when you, so they go back to the hotel. He, he decides... Jimmy decides he's going to fucking blackmail and be like, you're going to give me $10,000 and I won't tell John what I know. Right. Yeah. Good old and extortion. Yeah. He, yeah. He extorts him. And there's a really good scene of Philip Baker Hall kind of keeping the fucking demeanor up, but begging for his life. I know John and I love him like he was my own child, but I can tell you this. I don't want to die. I killed his father. I can tell you what it was. I, this is not an excuse. I'm not begging for clemency. All that matters, I do not wish to sacrifice my life for John's well-being, but I will sacrifice this money for mine because you have asked me. Because after this, I will have done all I can for John and for myself. I'm going to ask you with all the heart and sincerity that I have, please do not put a bullet in me. And please don't tell John what I've done. Saying like, I love John like a son, but not enough to lose my life. Like, I'll give you this money. Like, he's he's so in control, but you can see him like sort of trembling and like he's breaking a little bit. He's starting to fray. Yeah, uh, you can definitely see there's cracks forming. The fact that he said, like, I'm not going to forfeit my life for his. Yep. That one kind of took me by surprise. Like, oh, OK, that's not. He's not, yeah, he's not that good of a character. <laughs> yeah. Did you just become an anti-hero? Like, I mean, it, it, he was never a hero. There's no heroes in Paul Thomas Anderson movies. <laughs> There's no good guys sure. in Paul Thomas. All of the heroes are deeply flawed, and by the end of the movie, you're kind of disgusted with them. Now, That's what if, of... now, let's throw a little, you know, a little hypothetical out there. What if Sidney's character didn't come along, and John's character, what if he ended up uh, going, you know, dying or something? They only had a couple oh, bucks Sydney left. Oh, never met John? Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's a completely, oh, jeez. The whole movie, you're thinking hero, hero, hero. And then you I'm find not, out. I think. Well, no, 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 no. But there's no reason not to think hero. Sure. Yeah. There you, is just a weird unease about Sydney the whole movie. There, I don't think at any point, like, you're led to believe, like, this guy is being stalwart and good with no, like, there's nothing else to it. Like, I think there's always sort of that mood where you're like, but why? Like, there is always that, like, why is he doing this, though? Sure, if you want to go with the little gut feeling and do that. Yeah. But to me, there's no reason not to not to think he wasn't doing it to be. Yeah, they never really. Right. Until that line, you're like, oh, yeah. No. That line like unlocked like everything. Yeah. It's such a it's so it's such a simple like solution. Once you hear it, you're like, oh, of course, like he feels bad because he killed it. Because yeah, you find out that he's like a, a mobster from Atlantic City or he used City. to be. He ends up giving uh, Jimmy Samuel Jackson's character six thousand dollars cash, yep, just hoping to be done with it. You know, he's yep. like, I think he's like saying like I could get you the full ten or something like whenever in the future, but I six thousand right now for you in right. cash. So he takes it. He's like thinking he's good. Leaves. Everything's fine. And then you get this. You did you notice this little montage? It's not not a montage, but it's like I think uh, Elvis is in the background. Hmm. While Samuel Jackson's like having a night on the town with the money, where they keep cutting to him doing the craps, trying yeah, to yeah, and and he's got you know his hot date on his arm, right. and he's just 
in a suit. He looks like he's just having a night. He just got six thousand yeah. dollars. Everything's good. No. No, no. So, yeah, Philip Baker Hall breaks into Samuel Jackson's house and sits at a chair and waits for him for a full night. Terrifying. He's so in control. Te- he's absolutely, so scary. T- absolutely terrifying. He just sits in the chair and he's like, I'm good to wait here all night. Oh my Uses God. one of Samuel Jackson's own guns. And then, yeah, as soon as he uh, he comes in with his woman, they're about to start fooling around and he just fucking guns him down. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's no, like, line of revenge. There's no you know no no hot shot line it's like the end of john wick he just fucking walks up to the dude and kills him and it wasn't one bullet to the head he emptied that clip (laughs) he fucking emptied that clip on him body was hopping on the ground yeah and then um he spares the girl he does spare the girl so he's not a complete monster that's not i was like that's but he does take his money back well yeah you knew he was taking his money back i was actually because that you know they don't talk about in the movie i want to know how much I want to know how much Samuel Jackson spent on that night out because they were mm. having a night. I'm they telling were you, fun. Yeah. it looked like it was fun. <laughs> uh, but I was I was surprised. I, well, I wasn't surprised, but I was unsure if he was going to let um, the girl go or not. I, you know, this is my second time seeing it. The first time I saw it was like two or three years ago. Watching it this time, I was like, oh, does he shoot the girl? Because I was like, I could see it going either way. I could see him like sparing her life because he's like kind of a gentleman. Or I could see him like, nope, we have to cut off all, like, no witnesses, like, got to go. Well, because, okay, so the whole reason he kills Jimmy is, to me, I thought it was, this was the last little thing. Well, we don't know any, about anyone out back mm-hmm. east in the Lang City, but this was the last kind of, like, connection that could expose him. I think it's a couple things. I definitely think you're right. That's sort of the first thing I, I think of, too, is, like, he's got another loose end that he has got to tie off. But I also think part of it is he does love, he does love John. He wants to take care of John. He does not want the possible, uh, he doesn't want that threat of like having his relationship with John tarnished in any way, which is why you get that like incredible scene of him calling John in that, where he's like, I have to tell you something. And you're like, oh my God, is he about to come clean? Thanks for everything, Sid. Yeah, John, um, there's something I need to tell you. It's something you need to know. It's important. I need to tell you. I love you, John. I love you like you were my own son. Thank you, Sid. I love you, too. And he's like, I love you like you're my own son. And there's that fucking knockout shot of John C. Riley just takes so long to say thank you, Sidney. Like, yeah, I get, I get, so this part made me feel a little weird. Oh, how so? Because at this point, I was like, you know, I was I was down. Everything was smooth. When he says this line to him, instead of fessing up yep. and coming clean, it made me think, this guy has done all of this for his own it's self. It's for himself. Absolutely. None of it is for John. No, not at all. Because you, he, there is the catharsis of him telling John that he loves him. Like, I think on the surface, you do sort of feel good about that, especially when you see John's reaction. You're like happy for him. But then as soon as you like think any further, you're like, no, he should have told him. Like, he should have come clean. This is the right thing to do. Yeah, this is the father that we're talking about. Like, and he just, yeah, he absolutely, that that was selfish, like for him to to just do that for himself. If he's, if he's, you know, any sort of logical, practical person, I'm sure he looks at it as a win-win. Like I'm right. helping this guy out and, and I'm, I, but at the same, I, you got that, that pie, that pie chart. I think it's yep. about 90% of it is oh, directed yeah. towards himself, his, his own well-being. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mental, mental state. He it's just crazy, wants right? to feel good. Yeah. So I mean, and, and then, then you you get the I think is it the last scene, the very the last final scene? shot of him going back to the diner. Yeah, I the mean, very, what a, the very first diner that you start. This is what I'm at. talking about when like 
when I say like he just came up, Paul Thomas Anderson just came up the game. Jack's coffee Holy shop, fucking form. I think so. But he goes to the same diner that he was with um, John C. Riley with in the beginning of the movie. That's the first. That's the same diner he met John C. Riley with. He sits down to have some coffee and some cigarettes. The camera pans down to a little bit of blood on his cuff from killing Samuel Jackson. He just kind of pulls the sleeve over the blood. Cut to credits because that's the whole like that was the whole end scene that's, of him 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 telling John that he loved him but without telling him that he's the one who killed his dad. That's him pulling his cuff over the blood. That's yeah, him that, just try. He'll never cover it up, but he's going to do as best as he can. That scene is the entire movie, right? It's there. beautiful. That in, that scene is the entire movie. It's it's him. You know, he sees the blood, and instead of cleaning it up, instead of doing something about it, he just covers yep. it up. Yep. Just out of sight, out of mind. Exactly. And yeah. that's uh, it's a little villainous. He's, yeah, he's, he's not. I mean, listen, man, like I said, there are no um clean characters in a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. They're all Ugh. they're all pretty dirty. So. Hashtag anti anti-hero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fucking no, Sydney, I'm not, you know, Sydney and Venom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not giving Sydney that title yet, but he's certainly on the fence for he's sure. He's not heroic at all. That's the thing. He's just kind of a scumbag no. he's i don't know he, 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 all these characters that we're going to be talking about the thing about and i, I don't want to like draw con, like comparisons to nolan because like they're completely different directors they have nothing in common you know what i mean but right just because we just got done talking about nolan the thing about all of nolan's characters is they're so archetypal like you can easily define all of them because they're so like that's the hero that's the villain that's the you know that's the con man that's the woman in distress. Like they're all very, that's the dead wife. There's another one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the dead wife. And that's the dead wife. Uh, but you can put labels. And on then all that's um, Michael Caine. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I miss him already. <laughs> oh, oh God. my God. We're not going to see him once this whole season. Um, I just, I, I think you can make the case that had Sydney not intervened into these two characters lives, mm -hmm. their lives would have been a lot worse. If not, if not, with John C. Riley, might have been dead. I don't know. I I know it's a stretch, but when I see, you know, he was basically homeless at that yeah, point. Yeah, I agree. He had I a agree. couple dollars in his pocket sitting outside of a diner. Who right. knows what would happen to well, him? I totally agree. And, like, I think that's, like, sort of the fun of the this movie is, like, yeah, they probably would have been much worse off. But we we, as the audience, know more than they do about what's going on. And, like, they're not in that good of a position, even though they seem to be. But sure. Their savior is sort of also their... Their villain. Sure. Okay. So, uh, you know, in John's and Clementine's head, Sydney is a huge hero. He's the hero. Yeah. yeah. And but to yeah. us, we're supposed to think he's the hero. He's the main character of the movie. But right at the end, what's he do? Covers up the blood. It just makes you wonder how many times he's done that too. Like he's yeah. never, he's never owned up or faced any of his problems. Uh, yeah. He doesn't seem like a guy who likes to admit that he's wrong. So. No, I mean, you know, his, his casino tactic that's inherently wrong. Right. Yeah. It's then again, I don't know. You can make yeah, the case no that there. There's no you can make the there. case that casinos are inherently wrong yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no victim in that one. Um all right. Well, I think I mean, like this is a pretty short movie and there's not a lot of plot to it. It's mostly just people talking. Um, so there's not really much else to talk about, I don't think, that we we missed. Um kind of hit all my notes. So I'm happy to move on to us rating this movie. But yeah, I think uh, I think I'm ready to rate it also. You ready to rate it? Yeah. I'm giving it and I I'm gonna. We're gonna start this season clean. There's no stars. There's no buy rent pass. We're doing letter ratings. Well, we have different letter scales. No, we don't. <laughs> I use the S's. I will. I will transition into S's just for us to have just a clean, just a clean thing. Okay, because you, you really want to go with the letters instead of the stars. What do you want to do? What do you think is easiest? I I've been going with the. I feel like because our letter scales don't match up we should do our, stars we should do stars then let's do stars from now on we're doing stars gold stars. that's it yeah because it's just it's just a little too wonky okay i'll start first because this is your guy and i feel like yours is gonna be a little bit higher i still like this movie quite a bit i gave it a three and a half out of five yeah i give it a four stars i okay. like hey yeah i just love it i love the i i i've only seen it twice now the first time i watched it i was sort of like Oh, I can't believe I haven't seen this. I guess I should like knock this out. But that was the energy I was bringing to it. it was like, all right, like, gotta watch this movie. This time I was a lot more excited. Um, and it's just it it doesn't feel to me out of place. Like, following does feel like out of place when you watch the rest of his movies. It does feel like okay, that's clearly like a privately funded, you know, 
like he, he made that in college or something right like know? that that's a good movie but it doesn't feel like the rest of his movies this feels like the rest of his fucking movies he's fully formed like right right from day one so anyways four stars I mean, that's what i get definitely look gorgeous yeah, robert elswit the cinematographer he uses for pretty much every movie they all look amazing he does he's, yeah yeah yep. do you have any thoughts about the music i mean it's i thought the music in this was pretty good it was a little um uh, what, what's the word i want to use a little overly eclectic where like some of the movie had like a really cool like las vegasy jazz sound whereas like other scenes would have almost like a borderline horror soundtrack where like it's like these thin little violins that are supposed to like make you feel uneasy i thought it was all good it was just a little it didn't all go together i especially that you're mentioning the the vegas and the jazz yeah when, uh, that that prolonged shot of sydney walking through the casino that's a really good shot great shot wasn't yeah. that that was originally the title for this one sydney it? yeah sydney. he wanted to call it sydney but I think the studio was like, no, we need something more like commercially available, which is weird because Heart Eight sounds like a fucking porno. <laughs> but whatever, yeah. I like it. I like the title. Works for me. Yeah. So you're ready to play the game? I uh, yeah. Let's let's so, give it a go. This yeah, is the so this new is a, game. It's not a new game. It's a spin on the old game because the other game that we played was a little bit limiting. If we ended up doing a movie and the genres were like superhero it's boring you, you you get it right every time because it's like the same five movies yeah with grossing it usually is like exactly you know. so we're gonna we're gonna stick to the general uh parameters you're gonna have to guess five movies the five movies are gonna be based on the, like the top five grossing movies but instead of genres we're gonna do actors okay so um, i was gonna say that i think this you know because following for our last season was neo yeah. noir I, yes. I looked it up. Wasn't this one Neo Noir? I think also? you could put this under Neo Noir. Like, yeah, so, yeah, it's like kind of. So yeah, I mean, like we're we're gonna. I think this is gonna be a lot more easy because every movie has actors in it, and we can always pick a different actor. We're not gonna have to do the same ones twice. So we're gonna do uh, actors. So I want you to pick from one of the four leads. Okay. Um, sure. Let's go with. Uh, why, why not? Um, try to go easy. John C. Riley. Okay. So we're going to do John C. Riley's top five grossing movies. Now I'm going to let you pick. This is going to be like a rule that we use for the entire seer, the entire like game moving forward. Do you want to do the top five domestic grossers or the top five worldwide? Oh, that's a good question. It's not too much different, but there are like, sometimes there is like one or two different movies just because like some movies will make crazy money overseas. Oh boy. Um, yeah, I guess we can try worldwide. You want to do worldwide? Okay. Yeah, if it's if you know if it's too tough, we can always go to U.S. Right? Maybe. Well, real quick, John C. Riley. Yeah. Um, is he getting? <laughs> we try to avoid superheroes. Is Guardians of the Galaxy in there? Number one. <laughs> Gee, oh I was surprised gosh. that you. Okay, you hit it like right off the get the bat. I yeah. knew it because it's like we're trying to avoid comics, and boom, right off the I bat. I mean, listen, people are. I mean, if you had picked fucking Gwyneth Paltrow or Samuel Jackson, it would have just only been Marvel movies. So I'm glad you. I'm glad you went with him. Sure. Um, so yeah, so number one is Guardians of the Galaxy. That is his number one film. Number two, um, I'm going to give you a hint. Three of these are right, voice the acting. Wilfer oh, three of these are voice acting performances. One of them I've never seen or heard of this movie. Uh, so oh, number that's two, not good. <laughs> number two is an animated movie that I've never seen. Actually, I have heard of this movie. Um, oh, um, Wreck It Ralph. That is number five. Wow, Wreck It Ralph two. That is number four. Okay. Number two is an animated movie. I'm guessing this movie just did crazy money because it's a lot more of like a kid's movie. Um, I think it's a musical. Oh, oh, see? Yeah, every time John C. Riley in the musical, I think Chicago, but I know that's not it. <laughs> no, it's animated. Okay. Um, this is a tough one. I don't really know this movie. Oh, animated. Is it, it's not a Pixar? Is it a Pixar? It's not a Pixar. It's not even a Disney. It's not a Disney. Okay, is like the Illumination Studio, like Sing or something. Well, nailed it. Yep. <laughs> oh, it's, it's Sing. Okay. Wow. Wow. You you are so good at this fucking game. Um, and then the last one, number three. This is the one you haven't guessed yet. Number three. Um, this is a weird prequel. It's a prequel. Um. Uh. So it's it's. Let me just throw. The, it's not uh, Talladega Nights. It's not Step Brothers. It's no, not, none of those are prequels. <laughs> Well, I'm just, I figured those would be big hitters. No, this is more of an action movie. Um, it stars another actor who was in the movie that we're talking about today. Oh, uh, no, that's not it. I was thinking the island. No, but island is one of the title, the words in the title. Oh, really? Yep. It stars, it stars 
an actor who was in Heart Eight as well. Like, there's two actors from Heart Eight in this movie. Oh boy. Um, yeah, it's a prequel to Island. Island. It's a weird movie because it's like a prequel, but it kind of isn't a prequel to the last movie. It's like a prequel to whatever the next movie is going to be. Um, and it's one of those. It's one of those cinematic universe movies. Oh God. Um... Oh, this movie came out this year. This year, not not this movie. The 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 movie that this is a prequel to came out this year. What are the what are the like two big movies that have come out this year? I I have no idea. You do one of them. You I don't think you've seen it yet, but you've talked about how much you want to see it. Really big blockbuster. Kong vs Godzilla. Yeah. Really. Yeah. What's the what's the prequel to that? Oh, Kong Skull Island. <laughs> yeah. Ew. Yeah, it's number three, his third highest grossing movie. Wow. Yeah, man, it really took a walk for that one. You know, that's not that bad. that's that movie's not very good. No, I saw half of it and I said, I don't need to see the other half. Oh. Not, you, not you'd think as you know, like, oh, Brie Larson, Tom Hiddleston. Yeah. Is it Samuel Jackson in that too? And John Goodman. Right. Yeah. Like I was Dude. there for I heard John Goodman, I was there. Yeah. Boring. Fucking boring movie. Yeah. Did not like it. But John, I, I will say that John C. Riley was decent in it. He was pretty cool. He had a because he was sword. the weirdo on the yeah. island. Yeah, oh, exactly. yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, they used him exactly how they should use him, right? Yeah, and he's like, whenever he's like, kind of like giggling, laughing, like, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> that's like that's that's oh, hashtag god. my Riley. I love, oh my god! <laughs> All righty. Um, okay. Well, is there anything else that we need to do before we do the upcoming movie segment? I'm good over here. Do you, uh, do you have any movies that you are getting excited about that are coming out soon? Yeah, I actually might go see this one like today or tomorrow. Um, there's this movie, uh, just got released. It's an Australian crime movie called the dry and it stars Eric Bana. Definitely looking forward to it. I've heard it's pretty good. I don't know anything about it. Uh, that's coming from a director, an Australian director named Robert Connolly. Yeah, it's playing Any, at some of the indie theaters near me, so I might go. I might go swing in there and check it out. Heard it's really good. Anything else uh, Connolly done? No, no, no. I think he did like some TV shows. Okay. Do you remember that show? I mean, this is. I, I can't imagine why you would remember this. I remember it because the title of the show is so fucking funny, and what it was about is so like ludicrous to think that this was a TV show. The show was called The Slap. Yes. It's like about a guy who like slapped a girl at like a barbecue or something. Yeah, he like slapped it's like a, one of a his family daughters. Yeah, like a family. <laughs> it was a whole event. TV show. Yeah, I think Robert Connolly directed a couple episodes of that. How do you make a whole show off of one incident? <laughs> it's called the slap. <laughs> I always think about this fucking show, and I think that they, I think like SNL did a really funny sketch where like the guy just went around slapping everyone at the barbecue, and they kept like trying to yell at him. It was great. Um, Anyways, yeah, anyways, the dry, the dry is the movie that I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to. It, yeah, I do like Eric Bana. So I, I gotta say, I love Eric Bana, and he does not get the fucking cred that he deserves. I think he's a fantastic actor. Yeah, he got a little push there for a little bit, but no, early really... 2000s, he had like three big leading roles, and then, mm -hmm. then what? Yeah. Well, I mean, even when he got, you know, is the bad guy Nero in Star Trek, he's like he, so good in Star Trek, dude. He got he had a decent pop. Yeah, yeah. I think what I think it might have been Time Travelers. Uh, wife or something. That oh, was he in that? Yeah, with Rachel McAdams. I saw that in theaters. Yeah, I just like. I feel like he he has such a weird like rage to him that I really like, which is why he's so good in Hulk. But we'll get to Hulk some other day. <laughs> That's your boy Ang Lee. That's my boy. Um, so the movie I uh, there's not a trailer out. Um, okay, yet, but it's uh, and this director is he's not even that big. He's done the purges. Some of the purges. Okay, in sure. He's James virgin. DeMonico. Not familiar. Okay. No. Um, but he is directing my guy, Bobby Cannavale, this August. I it's coming love out. love Bobby Cannavale. Okay. Amazing. He's incredible. He's the so movie's good. called Once Upon a Time in Staten Island. It's about a coming of age story. Okay. And I've been waiting for Bobby Cannavale to get his due for a while. And Bobby, he was Bobby Cannavale is like the weird guy who like. Everyone, he's always a side guy. Everyone likes him. He's everyone would recognize guy. him. But like the only people who love him are like film freaks. You know what I mean? Like we're all okay. like, Bobby yeah. Cannavale's the best, you know, but he never gets like the leading roles or anything like that. I well, love him. That, his big thing, he, like I was really hype. He got the lead in uh, the now canceled HBO. I think it was Mick Jagger and like Spielberg. They were behind what? vinyl. Oh my this, God. And it, it no, was, that was, uh, that was Scorsese. Scorsese. Yeah. And, uh, 
but I think Mick Jagger was also behind it at one Maybe, point. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, that was a but, couple years. I think I canceled after like one season. Two seasons, no, I think. I think no, no, canceled. it was one. It was. Yeah, I think it got yeah. canceled. That's I was so movie. hyped. I was because it was Olivia Wilde. She was killing it. Is um, Bobby it's, Cannavale. Ray Romano was so freaking good. It's just the show is great. a great actor. And Bobby Cannavale was just murdering. Hey, every what's, single so what's week. this movie he's in? Once it's upon a time once in Staten upon Island. A, once upon a time in Staten Island, uh, supposedly due out this August. And listen, I've I've got stock. I bought stock early in Counter Valley. So like, yeah, you tell me he's he's gonna be in a movie. I'm gonna. I'm, he's got like five years until I'm like, oh, I guess it's just not gonna happen. Like he's got he's got some time. I mean, he was I, so good in The Irishman. Like he played um, the fucking uh, like the mob boss in The Irishman. He was so good in it. He was. Uh, I mean, another HBO, but third season of Boardwalk Empire. He played this. <sighs> I love him. Amazing uh, gangster, Chip Rossetti. He's the guy who Judy Greer marries in Ant Man. He's like the he's healthiest, uh, healthiest uh, split. Yeah, co-parenting situation <laughs> yeah. on TV. Like, <laughs> it's so good. I love yeah. it. I'm glad. I mean, you know what we should do? We should get uh, not you and I because we don't work in Hollywood. I I wish we could get an Eric Bana, Bobby Cannavale, like fucking team up movie. Okay, that's what I'm we should down. do. We should start mashing our upcoming movies to make a movie of our own. <laughs> I'm the, I'm, I'll, I'll drop the script right now. Yeah, I'm ready for it. Oh, man. All right. Anything else we want to talk about? Or are we all set? What do we got next on the docket? Next, next up, um, our audience gets to listen to two straight cis white men talk about porn for two hours. Oh, is it Boogie Nights time? Boogie Nights, baby. Yeah, we're okay. talking Boogie Nights next week. And it's actually going to be next week because now we're going we're going weekly uh, releases. So oh. this will release this Thursday. And then after that, every, I'm just going to do Thursday. Is that cool with you? I just picked Thursday arbitrarily sure sweet yeah i'll be sure to uh everyone bring your prosthetic wieners for the next episode yeah we're gonna talk about that for sure <laughs> uh for sure <laughs> uh all right well thanks everyone for listening my name is james i'm brent and we will see you next week 